Podcasting from Memphis, Tennessee. He's a soldier, storyteller, historian, and maybe a bit of a hellraiser. Click, listen, and enjoy. It's Dave Carter on the Ricochet Audio Network. Welcome to the program, folks. Delighted to have you on board today. I'm your tour guide, Dave Carter, and we'll be making some fascinating stops in our little excursion today. Uh, author and filmmaker Dinesh D'Souza will be along in just a minute. And we've got Ricochet member Jenna Stalker in the lineup as well. And it's always a treat uh, to hear from her. Meanwhile, that light at the end of the tunnel is not a train. It's the fast approaching election, which gives us either a chance to affirm uh, the concept of limited government, separation of powers, and essentially a government that exists to protect the rights enumerated in the Bill of Rights, i.e. the right to free speech, the right to worship and practice one's faith, the right to self-defense, or the right to property, the right to equal treatment before the law, or we affirm the idea that the federal government is uh, actually Santa Claus, a uh, uh, Uncle Sugar, if you will, who will give us free education, free health care, free whatever we want. Uh, someone else is going to pay for it. If you believe that, then P.T. Barnum was actually underestimating our gullibility. We either think of ourselves as free and uh, sovereign individuals or as wards of the state, dependent on a government that forces us uh, to work and labor on the behalf of others. That idea doesn't work. It's never worked. Just look at Venezuela. And that's what the other side offers. But that's just my take on it, so let's get down to business, shall we? It was 29 years ago that I watched a two-hour firing line debate uh, featuring William F. Buckley Jr. and a collection of scholars and intellectuals who debated the proposition that freedom of thought is in danger on American campuses. And that was my first exposure to my guest, Dinesh D'Souza, who at that time had just published a groundbreaking book titled Illiberal Education. Originally from Mumbai, India, Mr. D'Souza came to America in 1978 and graduated from Dartmouth in 1983. And while at Dartmouth, he founded the Dartmouth Review. He was a policy advisor to President Ronald Reagan, and he went on to author 15 nationally renowned books, many of them becoming number one New York Times bestsellers. He's a scholar, prominent intellectual, is in great demand on college campuses, and if that was enough to keep several people busy, uh, Dinesh is also an award-wielding filmmaker. Two of his films, 2016, Obama's America and America, Imagine a World Without Her, are the number two and number six highest-ranked political documentaries of all time. Uh, he served as the John M. Olin Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and the New York Times Magazine listed him as one of America's most influential conservative thinkers. His work has appeared all over the place, and I could sit here the rest of the day and rattle this stuff off, but I just want to get to talk to him. Oh, but one, one crucial point, though. Wikipedia described him as a provocateur, which tells me that he must be doing something right, and it's a privilege indeed to welcome him to the service of the day. Dinesh, how are you, sir? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. It's a delight. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. And I understand that you've got a brand new film, literally just came out, and it's already number one on iTunes and Amazon. Is that correct? Yes, it's called Trump Card. And my earlier films have all been released in the theater. But with this, with the theatrical picture a little bit uneven, mm -hmm. we decided to release this one straight to video on demand. So you can buy a physical DVD, or of course you can watch it on iTunes or Google or uh, YouTube or a whole bunch of platforms. And if I may say, the website is just trumpcardthemovie.com. That's okay. how to find it. <clears throat> and I, I've seen it, and it is it is stellar. It is awesome. And I, we'll, we'll get to that in just a moment. But with your kind indulgence, I want to set the stage a little bit as to how we got here in the first place. And I'm going to do some time travel back 29 years ago to that fine line debate on uh, freedom of thought in American uh, college campuses. And a comment that you made, it was that during a particular exchange, you noted that the prime movers and instigators of political correctness, speech codes, that kind of thing, were not a numerical majority, but that they made themselves out to be a moral majority. And you said, quote, they exercise a kind of moral leverage, and they're quick to brand any kind of opposition as being tantamount to bigotry, unquote. So my question is, number one, that's like Nostradamus. I mean, you nailed it. But my question is, since you spent so much time on college campuses, how, how have things changed in 30 years? Are the radical elements still a numerical minority, for example? Yes, the radicalism has gotten, I think, far worse on the college campus. My daughter is actually in her mid-20s. She graduated from Dartmouth as I did. So it's almost like that's a before and after a snapshot of what that college is like. Uh, and the bottom line of it is when I was a student, the college leaned left but there was debate. There were conservative professors on campus. You could actually hear rival and alternative points of view. Now that seems to have been extinguished to a large degree, and these colleges have become indoctrination factories. I think the second big and important change is that the craziness of the campus has now made its way to the street. 
I sometimes say that academia is the theory and Antifa is the practice. Okay. And what I mean is that the crazy doctrines of the campus are ex- exactly behind the people who are now knocking down monuments, raiding historical societies, attacking the statue of Abraham Lincoln, burning things, setting, breaking windows and pulling people out of cars. Mm, okay. Now, I'm not asking you... Um... This, that's just a daunting uh, picture that you, that you paint there. I'm not asking you to act as my therapist, but well, maybe I am. But anyway, I, am I being overly pessimistic uh, when I posit that the cultural and intellectual decline that, for example, Professor Alan Bloomage outlined in his book, The Closing of the American Mind, has metastasized to the point that it afflicts absolutely every aspect of American education, entertainment, and popular culture? Yeah, the problem is that the progressives have uh, taken over. And they have become very intolerant about any points of view that run against them. Uh, far from welcoming debate, they hate it because they, uh, they are unable to see their intellectual critics as being well-meaning adversaries. They see them as political enemies that need to be, quote, sort of dealt with. Uh, and this is the mentality behind saying, let's get people thrown off a digital platform. Let's get them fired from their job. Let's get them kicked out of Hollywood. Let's make sure this young academic never gets tenure. There's a kind of, you know, Orwell predicted this. He predicted that all forms of socialism, even even democratic socialism, push in the direction of tyranny. Right. And so we're beginning to see in this country the first whiff of what could be a very tyrannical and depressing future. Uh, you said uh, recently in an interview that I saw, you said that uh, the radicalization of the left has radicalized you in some sense as well. How, how's that? Well, I used to have a civics book idea of American politics. I thought it was essentially a gentleman's debate between two sides uh, that agreed about goals but disagreed about means. Right. I thought that all Americans agree we want to be a strong country. We want to be prosperous. We want to be an example to the world. Now, we might disagree about how the great American prosperity pie should be exactly shared. And so there's a legitimate uh, question about that. But I never doubted the idea that ultimately this is sort of two rival views that we put before the American people. But when I had my case with the Obama administration a few years ago, I realized that the left had become gangsterized. I saw it with my own eyes. And now, of course, Michael Flynn has seen it, George Papadopoulos, Carter Page and even Trump himself. So clearly the gangsterization of the democratic left has proceeded very far. It's a long way from the sort of nincompoopery of Jimmy Carter to the sheer malevolence of the Clintons and Barack Obama. Well, and a couple of days ago, I think it was, Keith Olbermann gave us a, a pretty chilling preview when he said even Amy uh, Coney Barrett and, and, uh, and just about everyone that backs her or the president needs to be criminalized and locked up. Yeah, I was actually quite shocked by the violence of that address and the use of language, too. First of all, he's talking about it's one thing to say, you know, Trump has committed high crimes and misdemeanors or or that there have been people who have violated the law. But to say that Sean Hannity and Amy Coney Barrett should be arrested. I mean, this is a kind of this is what the fascists did. And he also used fascist language. I mean, he used language like maggots. You'd have to go back to Germany in the 30s where the Nazis called Jews insects and maggots. Mm. I remember Goebbels was once asked something like, wouldn't you admit that the Jew is a human being? And Goebbels said, well, a flea is an animal, but what kind of an animal? So the point of using this kind of Olbermann language is essentially to suggest that these people should be exterminated. Because why call someone a maggot? What do you do with a maggot if not call in pest control and exterminate it? So you dehumanize them first, and then off we go from there. Um, Exactly. That brings us around to your new film, Trump Card Beating Socialism, Corruption, and the Deep State, in which you document uh, the radicalization of the left and the things they have in store for us. And you you don't just make assertions in the movie. Again, I've seen it. You take us with you as you do the research, as you conduct first-person interviews, and you provide and expose primary sources, correct? Absolutely. I mean, the movies are, well, this movie is based on my book, United States of Socialism, which is very thoroughly researched. But a book is different than a movie. A book lays out an argument. A book supplies references. A movie is an emotional narrative. It's ultimately an entertainment. And this is a very riveting movie. It's fun to watch. I hope you'll agree. And it's sort of horrifying in parts, frightening maybe in parts, but in the end, it's also very inspirational and motivational. Well, the history, as you pointed out, of, of the socialist movement, uh, of, of, of the totalitarian movement, is oftentimes rather frightening, isn't it? So it's good to, to put that on the film so people can understand what is going on here and what the, how high the stakes actually are. 
Absolutely. Uh, my wife's from Venezuela, and when Hugo okay. Chavez came to power in Venezuela, he denied he was a socialist. He said he was kind of a centrist. And in fact, it took him some years before he started the Socialist Party of Venezuela. But slowly, this kind of prosperous country that had a two-party system, a democratic form of government, slowly began to collapse. And not only economic collapse, but the emergence of thuggery on the street, of crime, of tyranny, of going after political dissidents, all the things that we see the first signs of in America today are now far advanced in Venezuela. So to me, that's the direction we're headed, not to Scandinavia or Stockholm, but rather to Venezuela and Caracas. Uh, and, and you point out in the film uh, the left's um, uh, love affair with Hugo Chavez and with the Venezuelan model before it, it uh, generated people eating out of dumpsters. Yeah, it's very, very illuminating where people do their political tourism. So even though Bernie Sanders says something like, I, I believe in the Venice, I believe in the Scandinavian model. Bernie Sanders has never been to Scandinavia, even though, by the way, he's part <laughs> Scandinavian. Oh, really? But he honeymooned in Moscow. And, you yeah. know, uh, Michael Moore went to Cuba to demonstrate the wonders of Cuban health care. A lot of Hollywood actors have gone to Venezuela. So it shows you that that's the kind of socialism they like. So for people uh, who aren't necessarily on uh, uh, yours and my side of the political ledger, uh, what is it that when they see this film that you'd like them to take away from it? Well, I, th I would urge any American to watch it in an open-minded way. It doesn't matter what side you're on because the film tells a story, and it tells the story by, su by supplying – you can see it for yourself. It's, it's yeah. a show, not tell. And so as a result, you can really make up your own mind. You can see if this is the America that you want. You know, you can there's a big debate about is Biden really a socialist or is he a socialist light? Uh, but if you think of the free market at one end of the spectrum and, and socialism at the other, just ask yourself a simple question. In what direction are the Democrats pulling? And the simple answer is that every Democrat, whether it's uh, Elizabeth Warren, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer or Joe Biden, they're all pulling in the socialist direction. Right. Um, and, uh, we keep hearing uh, that the polls are lining up against the president, but the polls were famously wrong in 2016. So what what's your sense of whether or not we can believe the polls this time around? How's that shaping up in your mind? Well, I confess this is not my area of specialty. I'm, I'm not that good at reading the tea leaves, per <laughs> se. I focus really more on the issues. Look, okay. But I also have an instinct about the good sense of the American people. I think the media bias is more transparent than ever. Biden is obviously a ridiculous candidate. It's hard for me to believe that any American with common sense would say that this kind of absurd man who barely knows, not even if he knows his middle name, yeah. if this is the kind of guy who can be the steward of a great country. You know, I'm, I'm going to reduce this next question, but I had Victor Davis Hanson on my show recently, and he, he suggested that the president – in the election ought to refrain from making this a left versus right referendum or a Democrat versus a Republican contest and instead frame it in terms of class. He refers to the Skype or the Zoom class, who many of whom sit behind their computers and feel organically suited to uh, to run the lives of other folks. And then, the, and then what he calls the muscular class, the folks who are on the front lines driving freight across the country, the first responders, those kind of folks. Do you think that would be good advice for the president to follow? That uh, I think that uh, another way to look at it is that the Democratic Party has now become the party of the rich. Okay. Republicans have traditionally been portrayed that way, and to some degree it was true. Uh, but Democrats now, the, the richest people in America support the Democratic Party. A lot of big corporations are funneling money, not just through the Democratic Party. They're giving money to Antifa and Black Lives Matter. So I think Republicans need to, uh, to realize that we are now the party of the middle class, and the working class. And that's not a bad thing. That's actually the long term future of the Republican Party. Uh, and whatever happens at this election, I'm very optimistic Trump will pull it off. Yeah. I think the consequences are going to be amazing. But uh, whatever happens in the election, that kind of platform, that kind of populist conservatism, I think, is the road to success in the future. OK. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, ask a question of you that I've asked to several folks. You'll recall in 2016 that people called it uh, the Flight 93 election where if we didn't get it right, that uh, all may be lost, right? Uh, is, is, do you believe that the same sort of thing applies, that the stakes are so high in this election that if we don't get it right, we may very well not recover? I, I think that, but I'd like to spell it out because it's so, you know, when people say it's the most important election of our lifetime, that has a familiar yeah, um, right. ring to it. I, I think that if Trump loses, there will be an effort to demonize the Trump phenomenon, to demonize all of the Trumpsters, the people associated with Trump, sure. to make this seem like a regrettable stain on American uh, life that should never be allowed to happen again. Uh, by contrast, if Trump wins, I think we could see not just policy change and political change and change in the courts, 
but cultural change. Trump comes out of you know, sort of the mainstream of American culture, the world of television and The Apprentice. Mm -hmm. Here's a guy who recognizes the importance of culture uh, because I think that's our battle ahead. Long term, whatever happens in the election, the left will still control the universities. They'll still control the media. They'll still control Hollywood. Uh, and we can't let that go uncontested because... Ultimately, it's not just about this election. It affects every election. And you seem to have made it your life's work not to let that go uncontested. And this, this is my last question, but you and I are about the same age, very close. Uh, you came to America in 78. I gather that you went almost immediately and began a lifetime's devotion to public policy. Is that, is that fair enough? Well, for the first couple of years, I frankly didn't know anything about American politics. Ah. I think I caught the Reagan bug in uh, Dartmouth in the 1980s. <laughs> I became very interested in politics. I joined a group of sort of band of conservative renegades. So, yes, by the time I graduated from college, I realized I, I began to understand better what it was I liked about America. It wasn't so much that I became a conservative, but once I became familiar with conservative ideas and beliefs, I realized that's what I always was. When you when you came to realize conservative ideas and beliefs, is that when you and you saw? I assume that, that they were, they were under attack even back then. Is that what stirred in you this interest to, to devote a lifetime to great matters of public debate? Yeah, very simply, I've enjoyed the benefits of the American dream. In other words, not just ladders of opportunity, but the chance to sort of be the architect of my own destiny. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that that's possible in many places in the world, if any, outside of America. So I came to appreciate what it is about America that gave me the kind of life that I've enjoyed so much. And I thought, well, wow, I really need to defend the sort of infrastructure that has made that possible so that my daughter and other generations can also enjoy those same dreams and live in a free country. Awesome. Folks, the movie is called uh, Trump Card, Beating Socialism, Corruption, and the Deep State. I've seen it. It's an ultra-high-definition presentation of the people on both sides of the, of the uh, political divide today. It's fact-based, and it's researched and sourced right in front of your eyes on the screen. So bring your predispositions and questions with you and see how they stand up to reality. Dinesh, uh, you said folks can down download this as well, or they can get the, C the uh, DVD, right? Yes, TrumpCardTheMovie.com. That's a good place to order the DVD for friends or watch the movie by video download. And you can watch it on any platform. I prefer people watch it on a big screen TV because it was made for the big screen. But hey, if you want to watch it on your phone or a computer, you can do that too. Whatever works. And I, and I think, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, your daughter's got a book out too, right? My daughter, Danielle, has a new book out. It's called The Choice, The Abortion Divide in America. It could not be more timely because of all this craziness going on around the court. A lot of that is about one single issue. Will Roe versus Wade be overturned? So you should have her on your show, and your listeners should to. check out her book. Fantastic. It's been a treat and a privilege talking to you after all these years. This, this, is, this is awesome. Uh, perhaps we can check in with you after the election and do an assessment as well. At that Happy point. to do it. All right. Thanks for taking the time to talk with us, sir. Take care. Folks, that's Dinesh D'Souza on the Dave Carter Program. Because what this country needs is more free speech worth listening to. It's Dave Carter on Ricochet. All right, so what do you think of Dinesh D'Souza? You know, when I first, uh, I first saw him on Fine Line in 1991, I mean, he looked like he was 12 years old, but he was a superb debater, a great writer, great researcher, and wise beyond his years, very, very impressive gentleman. And he's an inspiration given the amount of energy he devotes to so many projects simultaneously. And this latest movie is simply outstanding. I urge you to watch it. In fact, for some of you, I dare you to watch it. See the facts for yourselves. I think you'll be impressed. The Jenna Stalker will be along in just a moment. But first, hey, you enjoying the show today? You enjoy the various uh, podcasts on the Ricochet Audio Network? From Andrew Clavin's show to Commentary Magazine's show to the flagship podcast and so much more, there's something here for everyone. Now, as a rule, if you want to comment on the podcast post or comment on the main feed post or read uh, and comment on posts on the member side only side of the house, behind the paywall, well, that's going to run you four and a half bucks a month. And if you spend just 50 cents more per month, then you can write and publish your own articles on Ricochet and let the whole wide world see what you think about things. Now, here's an idea. Let's say you're not sure about all that and you don't want to spend four to five bucks to find out. All right, so here's, here's what we've done for the listeners to this program. Just go to ricochet.com slash gumbo. Since I'm a kid from Louisiana, that's what we go with around here. Ricochet.com slash gumbo. You get a free 30-day trial of Ricochet. All right, you can take a look, kick the tires, do whatever you want. Uh, 
crash the thing, it doesn't matter. Then after 30 days, if you want to continue your membership, then four and a half bucks gets you in the door. Sound all right? Of course it does. So just head on over to ricochet.com slash gumbo. That's G-U-M-B-O. And you can join the conversation. Distinguished the the best DJs actually from the rest of the herd was the fact that the the best DJs didn't talk over the music. You got some good guitar riff that you like. Well, the dummy won't stop flapping his gums. I hate that. Okay, so I admit it. I, I really don't have any excuse for my behavior here this morning, but but it's fun. I mean, we talk about serious matters all the time, right? Existentially serious matters. That doesn't mean we can't have a good time and grin every now and then and enjoy the enjoy the uh, the moment or whatever. So. Well, joining me now is someone that's becoming something of a regular here. Jenna Stalker is with us from Minneapolis, which uh, a few months ago looked like Hiroshima after Truman got through with it. But uh, Jen is a prolific writer on Ricochet, one of the best writers on the site, if you ask me. And she's a she's a Marine Corps veteran. And uh, Jenna, when when were you in the Marine Corps? Uh, so it was two thousand seven to eleven. So okay. I have to think about it so hard, yeah. and it time just goes by too fast. Yeah. So. Well, first of all, good morning. I'm sorry. I should say good morning. Good morning. Please. Yes. As you can see, I'm not as well organized as I might otherwise be, but uh, these things happen. And you were also a researcher at the Center for Security Policy in Washington, D.C. And uh, oh, oh, folks, by the way, I, I'm uh, so if you want to get in on the fun here and on, on the podcast, take me up on the offer I mentioned a little while ago about the free month's trial subscription to Ricochet. And uh, you just never know. I mean, they let me on this thing, and I'll be happy to let you on this thing. And we'll have a good chat, a uh, fun chat, which is, I'm sure, what Jenna uh, hopes we will eventually have here this morning. <laughs> it's always fun. Always but it's ricochet.com slash gumbo. Okay? Okay. So, Jenna, you worked at this uh, Center for Security Policy, right? What kind of what kind yeah. of what kind of research do they do? Uh, so they do a lot of uh, uh, military awareness, uh, future weapon systems. Um, mostly, you know, with Frank Gaffney. When I was there, we oh, focused okay. a lot on um, uh, the um, Islamic threat, uh, yeah. radical Islam, right. uh, here both here in America and abroad. Okay. So that was. I remembered him. Mm-hmm. I just didn't remember that that was his organization. Okay, good. And then you did a year of law school, and then you sobered up. And so now, <laughs> now right. you and your <laughs> I guess you could be sitting in front of the Senate right now. Um, so uh, you and your husband, who's also a veteran, reside in the Minneapolis area. Now, you wrote a fantastic piece a few days ago or a week ago, I guess, but uh, about a week ago called uh, America Needs Us Cowboys. And I, I guess it was a trip to a Seattle. Uh, I'm sorry, a saddle shop, not Seattle. God, it's just my second cup of coffee and it's not working. <laughs> it was a saddle shop in Minneapolis, right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, so it's Schatz lines. It doesn't. Thank uh, you. I read that. I read that. I read you... it, and I said, "I'm never going to be able. To, I'm going to need help with this." It's called Shot. What? Shot line. Okay. All right. Yeah. And it survived um, the riots. Yeah. So it's uh it's right on Lake Street. It's been there since I think 1911 ish. So it was found or 1907, and then they moved just like um uh, the next store over on the same block. Okay. Um. Uh, Founded by a, a German immigrant, um, and it's the third generation family owners. And I mean, all Western English saddles, cowboy hats, boots. That's so cool. Tack. And you, yeah, very cool. You wrote on on your piece. Um, I'm gonna quote you uh, pr- 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 pretty extensively as this goes. But you wrote, if perhaps it was the cowboy tough stubbornness, maybe the internet age makes its wares accessible beyond the changed scenery outside its doors. I think it all contributes to the store's survival. But it thrives because America still is still cowboy country. So, uh, you're right that America's had a long, long love affair with cowboys. Why do you, Why do you think that is? I think there's a certain uh, 
rugged individualism uh, associated with uh, the cowboy and, and maybe the wild, wild west. I don't know if it's so no. wild anymore, but, uh, uh, you know, people are, are – it's a place where people just want to be left alone and uh, to, to fend for themselves and not have so much oversight and interference. Um, and uh, there's always sort of a dichotomy between – um, the law and uh, an order and a little bit of taking matters in your own hands yeah, and, right. and taking responsibility for your own actions. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, something else that you wrote dovetails perfectly into that. You say that the, the American West of the late 19th century was a cruel, harsh, lawless frontier. And out of the mercilessness of the land was born this new hero who never looked for a score to settle, but nevertheless found himself defending the defenseless and standing between the tyrant and the just. The cowboy never makes easy decisions, but the line between right and wrong is always bright. So um, so do you see Americans, at least those Americans who right now are trying to preserve the country's founding ideals, rugged individualism, individual liberty, and, and, and a civil society, as having something in common with that iconic cowboy that you reference? I do, and I, I think it, it reflects on America more broadly, historically as well. Uh, I think if you look at you know, our participation in, you know, especially the world wars, uh, is kind of a reluctant, um, bitter of, of humanity and peace and, uh, standing up for what's right, uh, and the defenseless, um, and, and not particularly looking for the fight, but knowing that it's the right thing to do. Uh, and I think, and, and hopefully we have people that step up our leaders, uh, you know, as we see more statues being toppled, I think Seattle ha- saw its latest Lincoln and Roosevelt uh, statues toppled. And I, I uh, hopefully we have some leaders that, that say enough is enough and we need to preserve what is right and just. Although our history is flawed, it still is the best in the world. Right. Um, and we need to f- stand up for that and fight for it. Um, I didn't but know we that. never are go out and looking for the fight. You know, we're right. not we're not the aggressors uh, right. by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, you notice that the statues don't fight back, and so they they become the, <laughs> the targets, and uh, buildings don't fight back, so they become the targets. So essentially, these are cowards, and they need they need to be treated as such. There, there's my editorial moment for the day. Uh, my great grandfather. Well thank you. Uh, I'll be here all day, but don't forget to tap, tip, tip your waitress. My great grandfather. I believe I showed you his photo once. He fought in World War One, but as a young guy, didn't I think I did, didn't I? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but as a young guy, he hopped the train from Louisiana and went out west to work as a no kidding cowboy. Just took a train and off he went. And he said the gun smoke and the uh, iconic shows of the seventies and you know, that that depicted Western life were great. But they weren't realistic. He said it was a dirty, dirty existence. And by that, he meant they worked hard. They got righteously dirty living and working in the elements. But as, as you, but you know, he said the, the petticoats, no, that, that wasn't happening. <laughs> You know, well, cowboys didn't wear That's petticoats. That's probably the only anyway, way I could survive as a as a <clears throat> woman in the West. Yeah, right. Give me yeah. a pair of jeans. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get to work. Uh, yeah. But as you say, even the Greeks and the Romans had their legendary countrymen too, that they looked up to, and they tried to emulate to some degree. So we have the rugged individualism individualism of the cowboy. Is that an accurate comparison? I think so. I think you know our heroes, <clears throat> as we pass down their legacies from generation to generation. Um, you know, it gets it, it does get a certain um, idyllic uh, yeah, idea to it. Kind of romanticized uh, in a way. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <clears throat> but I don't think that that. I think for every romanticism that's associated with it, mm-hmm. uh, there's still an element of truth there, um, and that we we should aspire to that um, higher truth of uh, um, and not run away from it right <clears throat> i think we should always aspire to 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 an ideal um even though it's it's maybe unattainable but i think for the cowboy um that you know you know romanticism in, in the sons of pioneers or or whoever sure. it may be in, in song or film or television uh uh still is one that that holds on to that cowboy code of virtue uh and freedom that uh i think is very important to well, to pass on to the next generations a country needs its role models 
and and uh, and we have we have a lot to choose from. I'm going to I'm going with your indulgence. I'm going to read again. You know, if you quit writing such great stuff, I'd quit reading so much of it on, <laughs> on the podcast. <laughs> well, I wish I wish I could write down before I talk because I was tired. No, no, you're fine. I but, talked to you on. But uh, uh, you wrote on the world stage, the American cowboy is often used as a pejorative. Theodore Roosevelt may have been the original Rough Rider and Frontiersman, but Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush were reviled for their quote-unquote cowboy diplomacy and inelegance. General George S. Patton was rebuked for his frank style and harsh tone, but his tough-as-nails attitude brought uh, Allied victories in Europe. In cities in America, the police unhesitatingly answered the call for help from the same people, from the same people who publicly insult, harass, and abuse them. Our military men and women, our first responders, our emergency workers do the hard things that make the streets safe for us, often thanklessly, then return to their post, nothing, uh, expecting nothing in return. My fear, you write, is that we are more closely resembling the town than Clint Eastwood's High Plains Drifter, an outpost of cowards who trade their dignity for compliance with corruption and lawlessness. So can you kind of take us a little deeper into that? I, I assume you're making the point about Portland, Seattle, even Minneapolis and some other places where the inmates are running the asylum right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, and we're especially seeing it in Minneapolis now, even though the latest yesterday, the city council member um, dis- distanced herself from, uh, she basically said, the spike in the crime here is has nothing to do with us wanting to uh, the dismantle the police department. No, of course not. No, no. Send, send the police packing and the bad guys show up. That's purely a coincidence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, it's 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 definitely been a strain on the police here. Um, you know, they you push hard enough back on the people that are, are willing to sacrifice their sure. lives, their families' well-being uh, to protect us. And there's only so far they can be pushed before they, before they just call it quits and they and right. they don't come back. Yeah, uh, puts more stress on the ones that do remain. Uh, but I think in a broader sense, um, you know, for presidents, you know, they call well, there's cowboy diplomacy or you know, criticizing George Bush for saying you're either with us or against us. Uh, I think it's important to in the fight of, of good versus evil, it's important to have that bright line. Uh, the more ambiguous you get, the more it's easy for people just to hide under some guise of uh, pretentiousness or or uh, virtue signaling or, or san- yeah. sanctimony uh, that that they're above what needs to be done, um, which is doing the hard things, making arrests or or uh, joining a war effort. Um, you know, without those people. We have nothing. If you don't, um, if you don't draw a, a bright line, as you say, and the gray area gets larger and larger, that gray area contains loopholes, and people will exploit them. Yeah, yeah, and I think you know, I grew up uh, watching a lot of westerns with with my parents, yeah. and you know, we'd always High Plains Drifter always stuck out to me as as sort of a n- nightmarish, uh, uh, garish reminder of. Uh, how much people will just hide in the herd and uh, um, use use other people's willing sacrifice as cover for their own cowardice. Yeah. And I, I think that's one of the things that I always took away from it, you know. Uh, and Clint Eastwood ends up kind of teaching them all a lesson and exposing them for what they are. Great movie. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, and, the, and, the, and so many of the townspeople had gone along with it. Uh, Dinesh D'Souza made a point, uh, well, in, when he and I talked, but then he made, made it years ago, that you have a people, uh, have a group of people on campus, for example, and other, other, other areas, the radicals, they're not u- numerically a majority, but they fashion themselves to be a moral majority, and they take advantage of the basic goodwill of other folks just not to get involved in the craziness, and they exploit that. Mm-hmm. And so silence uh, on the part of, the, of good people becomes a means for them to continue uh, the, the radical F, uh, uh, actions that they're doing and tearing the place apart where there's statues or assaulting the police or whatever. Yeah, and, and, the, and the farther along it goes, the harder it is to fight back, Correct. the more entrenched they get. Um, and I think we're really seeing that now, especially, um, you know, as we see the the rewriting of history, um, the miseducation of our youth, um, and, and the lies that, that are starting to 
kind of be gaslit into reality, uh, whether no. it's the 1619 project or, right. or I mean, pick your the flavor of the month, I guess. Yeah. Um, as far as that goes, so. Yeah. Um, and then the, so then the farther extreme you have to kind of get uh, uh, to to make that correction. Um, so and, and it just turns into this extreme back and forth. And it's going to be harder, like as you say, the, the longer it goes on, the harder it is to to, to roll back. And restore some normalcy. Last question, but I've, I've posed this question to a lot of folks that I that I respect and whose wisdom I respect. So now you're the latest recipient. Oh jeez, um, <laughs> boy! I got to look for somebody else. That yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Because I, 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 I and you can you, you may want to turn this into an article. I don't know, but I, I've you remember in 2016 it was all about the flight 93 thing, right? Mm-hmm. Anyway, yeah, Michael Anton. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, I'm wondering because every four years uh, we hear this is the most important election in our lifetime. Now we're hearing this is the most important election in American history. However, when you consider things like uh, packing the court and uh, uh, just blowing up the uh, filibuster and all kinds of things that would really eviscerate the separation of powers and cement a radical, permanent, m- m- radical uh, governing majority, then you begin to wonder: Is this, you know, is is this a, such a pivotal election after all? So my question to you is: um, We're seeing a great many issues and policies framed in very stark relief right now. Do you think this election constitutes perhaps our last chance to get it right, to avoid the whole country descending into that outpost of cowards that you that we've been talking about? Uh, is this is this the last exit on the highway to hell, basically, or, or not? What do you think? I think it's, if not the last exit, maybe the second to last. Okay. Uh, uh, I think if if we if Donald Trump loses this election, um, and I think the way the people, uh, even on the right side, are framing it as all about Trump, uh, mm-hmm. without looking the reasons at the reasons why he was elected in the first place and why people backed him uh and then and then just putting all their eggs in the well he's just uncouth uh, the people that voted for trump deserved what they got instead of looking at maybe a little more introspection on right. uh, where the conservative movement is going or where republicans uh where they're missing the message from people uh regular people um, yeah. instead of looking down at them, uh, then I think then, – then, yeah, then I think if they fail to reflect on those particular things, then I think we are lost because they're just going to side – it's just going to be um, a total steamroll from the left after that because they've proven they don't really want to fight. So uh, – It's the, uh, it's the if, ratchet effect. Whatever change there is, <laughs> it, it's a pause in the steady march to the left as well they've been able to, to do to this point. Yeah, and I, I really think that they have failed to understand the value of pushing back. Uh, you know, we, uh, this is one thing that I was thinking about writing about uh, today um, for this week was how, you know, they always say about, oh, you can't, you know, Trump is the character issue. But, you know, they, they criticize Mitt Romney for his character. They criticize Brett Kavanaugh for his character. So it doesn't really – they're going to criticize whoever it is for their, their – whatever it is. They could be the second coming of Jesus, I don't know, and still say something terrible about him, and, and, sure. and it wouldn't matter. So uh, you just fight, please. They, and, they and, routinely and vilify whether it was Romney or McCain – or George W. They vilify them when they're in office or when they're seeking office. They are the they are the they are Hitler incarnate. Then after they've been trounced or they've left office, suddenly they grow a halo, and they're okay now. But it's the next guy that's awful. They've been doing that since Nixon, at least. Yeah. So. Yeah, and they're just going to keep doing it. Right. So uh, to say that Trump is some anomaly, uh, that he's worse than all the others, I mean, it's it's. I think it's a losing argument. It's it has no, no teeth to it. So. Particularly when you look at the uh, at the opposition. I mean, you just you can talk about individuals, but ultimately it's the agenda of the party that matters a great deal. So. Absolutely, and I, I really think that uh, uh, the Democrats are. I, mean, I don't want to say the enemy of the people, but certainly the Constitution at this point. So um, we've seen it with their court packing arguments, uh, you know, their lionizing of, of one justice right. uh, to do their legislative bidding. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's 
just part I'll, and parcel uh, of their agenda. I'll paraphrase Ben Shapiro. He said that uh, the conservatives view the, view the Supreme Court as a means to protect and defend the Constitution. Uh, liberals view, view the Supreme Court as a means to enact their agenda, period. Abs- absolutely. Well, Jenna, as always, this has been a treat. It's been fun. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> folks, you gotta you gotta check Jenna out on Ricochet and on Twitter as well. I mean, she she occasionally sends these thunderbolts of truth that are cleverly disguised as tweets. But I mean, it's good stuff. What is what is what is your handle? Or what 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 are we supposed it's to call at, you on Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> at Jenna Lynn, okay, uh, eighty eight. At oh. Jenna Lynn eighty eight. L Y N N. Two N's in Lynn and two N's in Jenna, right? You got it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Look, it's been a pleasure as always, and I'll probably get you on here after the election so we can make an after-action assessment of what ha- what in the hell happened. Oh boy. Yeah. That, that'll be a good. That'll <laughs> yeah, be good be no fun. matter what. It'll be it fun. always is with you. Yeah. Well, thank you, and take care, folks. That's Jenna Stalker on the Dave Carter program. For the person who has everything, it's antibiotics. No, wait. It's Dave Carter on Ricochet. That's Jenna Stalker. Now, if you want a good reason to become part of Ricochet, one of those reasons would have would be the chance to interact with folks like Jenna and so many others on Ricochet, whose insights and perspectives are always worth reading and hearing. I mean, even if you don't always agree, and trust me. Not everyone on Ricochet walks in lockstep on any number of topics, and there have been some quite spirited debates on the site. Even when you don't think you agree with someone, you can still learn from them and understand at least why they think as they do and what kind of data they have to back up their assertions. I'm a bit of a stickler on that point, by the way. I got into a a mini-debate on social media a few days ago with respect to uh, former First Lady Michelle Obama's assertion that the research backs up, quote-unquote, the, the claim that what we've seen uh, this summer has been an overwhelmingly peaceful movement for racial solidarity. Where is she missing the point, uh, one, one guy asked, and at which point I laid out exactly what the research backs up, which includes 12,045 incidents of civil unrest between May 26th and September 16th, with 633 of those incidents coded as riots by the nonprofit Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project, which is supported in the U.S. by Princeton University. Fifty-one of those riots lacked information about the rioters' identities, but of the remaining 582 riots in which the identities of the rioters were known, Black Lives Matter uh, activists were involved in 95% of the riots, rendering Mrs. Obama's assertions about as reliable as those of a mid-level Soviet apparatchik. The response from the other party to all this was uh, this discussion was to reduce the actual research to picking cherries. You pick the ones that you want. Okay, so one side in the debate deals in hard data and facts, and uh, and the other side uh, deals in uh, a continuing narrative of endless oppression and systemic justice and in half truths and presuppositions from which no comprehensive analysis is allowed to intrude. They say silence is violence. Well, speech is violence, too, they say, depending on the pigmentation of the person that's doing the speaking. I say that silence in the face of riots and assaults and plunder and lawlessness is tacit encouragement, and we no longer have the luxury of remaining silent. On Election Day, we should make our voices heard and make them heard resoundingly. Now, between now and then, I'll keep bringing you some of the best voices, some of the best minds, and uh, the commentary out there. And I invite you to listen. Draw your own conclusions, please. And if you enjoyed the show today and you'd like to hear more of this kind of thing or read a collection of my columns and essays and stuff, then I invite you to go over to, invite you to, go over to Dave Carter Online, where you'll find a lot of, uh, more of this kind of thing, from articles I've written over the years to uh, current articles of interest that uh, others have written. There's also a page of podcasts for your listening pleasure, which will include this podcast as well, and a page called The Inkwell. Now, that's where I write more introspective pieces for readers of my website, including a piece I wrote just a, a week or so ago called Why Do I Do All This in the First Place? Why do the writing, the podcasting, the incessant reading and learning and passing along these things that people might enjoy thinking about? Well, the short answer is because that's the way I'm built. But see for yourself over at DaveCarterOnline.com. Check out the Inkwell page and read all about it. The podcast here continues to grow as it is currently heard all over the world, and we're certainly grateful that you're listening in with us today. Please feel free to go over to iTunes, give us a five-star rating, write your own comments about the show. I read them. And the more good ratings we get, the course, the faster we grow and the better things become. So with that, uh, I extend my thanks and gratitude to Dinesh D'Souza for talking with us and to Jenna Stalker for sharing her insights. 
And with special thanks to you, the listener, I'm Dave Carter, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to The Dave Carter Show. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you won't miss a single episode. And while you're there, please leave a review and tell us what you think. And on behalf of all of us at The Dave Carter Show and the Ricochet Audio Network, thank you for listening.